Chapter 2.1 After they had come to the designated place and scattered the seeds, their hearts filled with great perplexity and just a little hope, the two Sangama brothers climbed to the top of a hill of large boulders and thorn bushes that tore at their peasant clothes and sat down in the late afternoon to wait and watch. After no more than an hour, they saw the air begin to shimmer as it does during the hottest hours of the hottest days, and then the miracle city started growing before their astonished eyes. The stone edifices of the central zone pushing up from the rocky ground, and the majesty of the royal palace, and the first great temple too. This was forever afterward known as the underground temple, because it had emerged from a place beneath the earth's surface. And also as the monkey temple, because from the moment of its rising it swarmed with long-tailed gray temple monkeys of the breed known as Hanuman Lungors, chattering among themselves and ringing the temple's many bells. And because of the gigantic sculpture of Lord Hanuman himself that rose up with it, to stand by its gates. All these and more arose in old-fashioned splendor and stared down toward the palace and the royal enclosure spreading out at the far end of the long market street. The mud. Wood and cowshead hovels of the common people also made their humble way into the air at the city's periphery. A note on monkeys. It may be useful to observe here that monkeys will play a significant role in Pampa Campana's narrative. In these early verses the benevolent shadow of mighty Lord Hanuman falls across her pages, and as power and courage become characteristics of Bisnaga, the real-life successor to his mythical Kishkinda. Later, however, there will be other, malevolent monkeys, to confront. There is no need to anticipate those events any further. We merely point out the dualist, binary nature of the monkey motif in the work. In those first moments, the city was not yet fully alive. Spreading out from the shadow of the barren bouldered hills, it looked like a shining cosmopolis whose inhabitants had all abandoned it. The villas of the rich stood unoccupied, villas with stone foundations upon which stood graceful, pillared structures of brick and wood, the canopied market stalls were empty, awaiting the arrival of florists, butchers, tailors, wine merchants, and dentists, in the red-light district, there were brothels, but, as yet, no whores. The river rushed along, and the banks where washerwomen and washermen would do their work seemed to wait expectantly for some action some movement that would give meaning to the place. In the royal enclosure, the great elephant house, with its eleven arches, anticipated the coming of the tuskers and their dung. Then life began, and hundreds, no, thousands, of men and women were born full-grown from the brown earth, shaking the dirt off their garments, and thronging the streets in the evening breeze. Stray dogs and bony cows walked in the streets, trees burst into blossom and leaf, and the sky swarmed with parrots, yes, and crows. There was laundry upon the riverbank. And royal elephants, trumpeting in their mansion, and armed guards, women, at the royal enclosure's gates. An army camp could be seen beyond the city's boundary, a substantial cantonment in which stood an awesome force of thousands more newborn human beings. Equipped with clattering armor and weapons, as well as ranks of elephants, camels, and horses, and siege weaponry, battering rams, trebuchets, and the like. This is what it must feel like to be a god, Bukka Sangama said to his brother in a trembling voice. To perforam the act of creation. A thing only the gods can do. We must become gods now, Hukka said, to make sure the people worship us. He looked up into the sky. There, you see, he pointed. There is our father, the moon. No, Bukka shook his head. We'll never get away with that. The great moon god. Our ancestor, said Hukka, making it up as he went along, he had a son, whose name was Buddha. And then after a number of generations, the family line arrived at the moon king of the mythological era. Puravas. That was his name. He had two sons, Yadu and Turvasu. Some say there were five, but I say two is plenty. And we are the sons of the sons of Yadu. Thus we are a part of the illustrious lunar lineage, like the great warrior Arjuna in the Mahabharata, and even Lord Krishna himself. There are five of us too, Bukka said. Five Sangamas. Like the five sons of the moon king. 
Hukka, Bukka, Pukka, Chukka, and Dev. That may be so, Hukka said. But I say too is plenty. Our brothers are not noble characters. They are disreputable. They are unworthy. But yes, we will have to work out what to do with them. Let's go down and take a look at the palace, Bukka suggested. I hope there are plenty of servants and cooks and not just a bunch of empty chambers of state. I hope there are beds as soft as clouds and maybe a women's wing of ready-made wives of unimaginable beauty as well. We should celebrate, right? We aren't cowherds anymore. But cows will remain important to us, Hukka proposed. Metaphorically, you mean, Bukka asked. I'm not planning to do any more milking. Yes, Hukka Sangama said. Metaphorically, of course. They were both silent for a while, awed by what they had brought into being. If something can come out of nothing like this, Bukka finally said, maybe anything is possible in this world, and we can really be great men, although we will need to have great thoughts as well. And we don't have any seats for those. Hukka was thinking along different lines. If we can grow people like tapioca plants, he mused, then it doesn't matter how many soldiers we lose in battle, because there will be plenty more where they came from. And therefore we will be invincible and will be able to conquer the world. These thousands are just a beginning. We will grow hundreds of thousands of citizens, maybe a million, and a million soldiers as well. There are plenty of seeds left. We barely used half the sack. Bukka was thinking about Pampa Campana. She talked a lot about peace, but if that's what she wants why did she grow us this army, he wondered. Is it peace she really wants, or revenge? For her mother's death, I mean. It's up to us now, Hukka told him. An army can be a force for peace as well as war. And another thing I'm wondering, Bukka said. Those people down there, our new citizens, the men, I mean, do you think they are circumcised or not circumcised? Hukka pondered this question. What do you want to do, he asked, finally. Do you want to go down there and ask them all to open their lungis, pull down their pajamas, unwrap their sarongs? You think that's a good way to begin? The truth is, Bukka replied, I don't really care. It's probably a mixture, and so what? Exactly, Hukka said. So what? So I don't care if you don't care, Bukka said. I don't care, Hukka replied. Then so what, Bukka confirmed. They were silent again, staring down at the miracle, trying to accept its incomprehensibility, its beauty, its consequences. We should go and introduce ourselves, Bukka said after a while. They need to know who's in charge. There's no rush, Hukka replied. I think we're both a little crazy right now, because we are in the middle of a great craziness, and we both need a minute to absorb it. And to get a grip on our sanity again. And in the second place, and here he paused. Yes? Bukka urged him on. What's in the second place? In the second place, Hukka said, slowly, we have to decide which one of the two of us is going to be king first. And who will be in the second place? Well, Bukka said, hopefully, I'm the smartest. That's debatable, Hukka said. However, I'm the oldest. And I'm the most likable. Again, debatable. But I repeat, I'm the oldest. Yes, you're old. But I'm the most dynamic. Dynamic isn't the same thing as regal, Hukka said. And I'm still the oldest. You say that as if it's some sort of commandment, Bukka protested. Oldest goes first. Where does it say that? Where's that written down? Hukka's hand moved to the hilt of his sword. Here, he said. A bird flew across the sun. The earth itself took a deep breath. The gods, if there were any gods, stopped doing what they were doing and paid attention. Bukka gave in. Okay, okay, he said, raising his hands in surrender. You're my older brother, and I love you, and you go first. Thank you, said Hukka. I love you too. But, Bukka added, I get to decide the next thing. Agreed, said Hukka Sangama, who was now King Hukka, Hukka Raya I, 
you get first pick of bedrooms in the palace. And concubines, Bukka insisted. Yes, yes, Hakaraya I said, waving an irritated hand. And concubines as well. After another moment's silence, Bukka attempted a great thought. What is a human being, he wondered. I mean, what makes us what we are? Did we all start out as seeds? Are all our ancestors vegetables, if we go back far enough? Or did we grow out of fishes, are we fishes who learned to breathe air? Or maybe we are cows who lost our udders and two of our legs. Somehow I'm finding the vegetable possibility the most upsetting. I don't want to discover that my great-grandfather was a brinjal or a pea. And yet it is from seeds that our subjects have been born, Hucka said, shaking his head. So the vegetable possibility is the most probable, 